Oh, man. Uh, that's funny that you said that, uh, actually, because I, I told Deborah just, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I, I said, babe, I said, I just feel like our relationship with YWAM Kansas City just keeps getting better. Like, I just felt like it was like, it was like it's been three and a half years since we've been, we landed here with you guys, and uh, it's been a joy, and we have just grown to love this space and love being a part of the family here just seeing what God's doing and the way that he's advancing his kingdom from this place. It's a remarkable opportunity. I hope you, I mean, so often we're in a place and we don't realize the glory of the location we're in sometimes until afterwards. And so I just want to say to all of us, like, you are in a glorious moment in human history and you're in a glorious location and go for it and take Take in all that you possibly can and give all that you possibly can. This is, uh, I think this is one of the most strategic locations on the planet right now. And I, I, that could sound like hype, but I don't think it is. And so there's something that God's doing in our city and there's something that God's doing in our nation. And there are moments that we could feel like if, if, we're, if we're just watching the news and if we're just looking at what's happening around us, we could feel overwhelmed that it's just like, oh man, this is like, we are on a steady decline to nowhere and Jesus is about to split the sky or we're about to blow everything up. And I was, uh, I was up at a church in Minneapolis a couple weeks ago and, and just sharing with some friends. And normally when you're visiting a local church, you really, I mean, you want to bring a word of encouragement. You want to bless them. You want to bless the local pastor. You don't want to be controversial. That's not, the goal is not to be controversial. You let the pastor be controversial. You just go in to bless and love them. But in that moment, I just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in the congregation. I, and I, and I'm a little bit aware of some of the political views because I have history in this church. And, and I just started the whole conversation, but I don't, by saying, I don't know about you, but but I believe that we are in need of a change in government. And, and of course, you know, if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you, you could think, it's like, whoa, like that's a big statement. You know, like, does that mean you want to replace the current government with the opposite party? And it depends, you know, if you're a Democrat or Republican, is that positive or negative? And you just don't know. But the truth is that was the ache that was on the inside of my heart and is on the inside of my heart is we are in need of a change in government, not just in our nation, but, but in all the nations of the earth. I mean, you look even at just what happened in Afghanistan in the last month, and you realize that we're in need of a change of government. Like all, there were so many governments of the earth actually working together to, to bring transformation. And we think that we can bring our wisdom and, and our prosperity and our economic systems. And, and we think that we can offer all of that. And it's gonna bring transformation. And what we saw was just like in a moment, 20 years worth of labor was like, it was over. And you're like, oh, we need help. And we're just in this place, whether it's Afghanistan or the growing unrest in the Middle East or the African nations in turmoil continuing to align themselves with Islam and even China, Russia growing in its communism again, China persecuting the church again, South America aligning itself with social, socialism and and, and really even communism in many places. And, and then, of course, right here at home. And, and if you just watch the news, it's overwhelming. And you just think we're at the end. But I, I believe that Jesus felt much of that same groan when he walked on the planet. It was that groan of a shift of government. You know, the Jewish people were hoping Jesus would come and shift the government I mean, we're, we're tired of the Roman oppression, you know, the government that could crucify people at will and hang them on the side of the road just to make a point. And so the Jewish people were eager for a shift in government and hoping that Messiah, that Jesus would bring that shift. And so Jesus felt the ache. He, he felt the groan. He felt the longing of his own people. And he felt it more than we could possibly imagine because he felt it for generations and generations. He felt the weight of thousands of years of human history groaning. And Jesus was all about the transition of government, but his aim was really to transition our hearts. 
It was a government that had to transition in our hearts before it could transition on the earth. And so I believe we're in that same time in human history. We walk on the planet and we groan. We groan for just a transition of government, for righteousness, for the government of God, for the advance of his kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven. And, and I believe that today we can actually walk in the reality, even as we hear testimonies of God bringing freedom to people's lives, as we look around the nations of the earth, we're not primarily taking our information from what we see on the news, but we're actually looking at what God's doing in, in the church. And we see that there's way more going on than we could possibly imagine, that in some of the most tumultuous places on the planet, the, the church is growing exponentially. Some of the fastest growing churches on the planet are our nations in the most turmoil where we would ache for a shift in government for them. But at the same point in time, God's shifting government by expanding his church. And I believe that David was, was, a, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a signpost. Was a, Isaiah 55 calls David a witness. It's, Isaiah says, I've given David as a witness for generations to come. And I believe that King David... The way that he ruled and reigned his kingdom, of course, the Bible says that David was a prophetic picture of Jesus, that from the line of David, the Messiah would come, that someone would sit on the throne of David in the line of David forever. It was a massive promise. And of course, we know that just a couple generations later, the kings in David's line had abandoned God and there was destruction and war and, and eventually uh, they were taken off to Babylon in exile. And so you wonder what happens to the promises. And for hundreds of years, the people wondered what happened to the promises until Jesus showed up in the line of David to transition government. And there's something that David did when he was king that is so unlike any other king. So unlike any other government. In fact, he made a revolutionary first move. And I, even as I was preparing and, and, and studying some of this, I'm like, oh, God, what it would be like? What would it be like for the president of the United States to make a bold first move like King David's first move? What would it look like for the president of the United States to take oath and, and make a move in the shift of his government that would cause many to, to wonder what he was doing? But, but this is what David did. David's first move wasn't to expand the military. It wasn't, it wasn't to make a shift in economic policy. His shift in government was, was this. He, he did three things. He said, I'm going to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. I'm going to bring the presence of God back to the center of this nation. I'm going to put the Ark of the Covenant in a tent. And I'm going to surround it by singers and musicians. And they're going to worship me 24-7. And if you calculate what that would cost every year for King David to establish that, it was about a billion dollars. So you can imagine if the President of the United States came to the podium and said, this is what we're going to do. We don't have answers anymore. We don't, know how to, we don't know how to make our culture and society better, different. We're, we're at a loss in this moment. And we're just going to bring the presence of God back to the nation. And we're going to surround this place of his presence with kings and priests. And they're going to minister to God day and night. I'm like, oh, this would be a good day for us, wouldn't it? Be a good day for us. And I believe God's doing this right now. It might not be President Biden. It might not be another president or prime minister that's doing this, but God's doing it. God's bringing his government. And the great gift of the moment that we are in in human history is that it's really clear. It's always been real, but now it's just more clear that we cannot rely on the governments of men. That we, cannot rely on the relig that we cannot rely on the government of this world, but actually have to lean in a deeper way. And we're in a moment, even for the church, to lean in a deeper way into God and his ways, as opposed to leaning into our, our, our Christian culture or our Christian government, especially here in America or in the West. 
And so for a moment, I just want to ask the question because I think it applies to us. Why did David do it? Why did David make it his first priority to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the center of the nation? Why did he cover it with the tent, which, by the way, was against the law? Like all of the Old Testament up till that point in time said it had to be behind the veil, in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. Only the priest could go in to, to the presence of God. How? How? Have you ever thought, asked yourself the question, how did David get away with just putting a tent over the Ark of the Covenant and surrounding it by singers and musicians and calling it good? How did he do it? And why did he do it? And I believe we have to ask ourselves the question because the government that David established is the government that God said is going to last forever. It's actually that government that Jesus fulfilled in Acts 15. It's it's that government that's going to last forever. It's that kingdom that's going to last forever. It's that kingdom that we've been brought into. So as believers, as Christians, we need to be asking ourselves the question, why? Why why David? Why? Why David? Why his kingdom? Why his line? Why the Messiah coming from David? And why that strange tabernacle in the middle of Old Testament history that was unlike anything that we've ever seen? If you take a closer look at David's tabernacle, it's actually difficult. And here's the power of it. It's actually difficult to try to deny that David built his tabernacle off of a pattern he saw in heaven. We often pray for the, Father, let it be on the earth as it is in heaven. Well, I believe David saw heaven. I believe before John saw heaven, David saw heaven. And what he established in his tabernacle was because of something he saw. And you guys have read this passage, Psalm 63, verse 2. I was going to have all the passages up here, but I think we had some technical difficulty. But just jot them down. Look at them later because I'm going to move through them kind of quickly. But I would encourage you to look at them because it's always better to see it with your own eyes. But I'm going to move quickly. So, So you've heard this passage from David, and often we symbolize it as like David had an encounter with God. Psalm 63, verse 2 Where the psalmist says, see, I have looked upon you in your sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. So, of course, you can symbolize that and go, David had an encounter with God. But I believe Psalm 63, if I just just look at historical accounts, if I just look at biblically what was happening, if I look at what David actually established, I would look at Psalm 63 and I go, I think David was taken up. I think David saw something. Psalm 63, verse 2, when he says, See, I have looked upon you in your sanctuary. He didn't say my sanctuary. He says your sanctuary. I have beheld your power and your glory. And it's not unusual because Moses, you know, had the same experience. Hebrews 8, verse 5, it says they serve a copy when they're talking about the tabernacle of of Moses or the temple of Solomon. It's saying they serve a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Friends, Moses saw the temple in heaven and constructed that first tent after what he saw. It was an on earth as it is in heaven reality. Uh, Revelation eleven nineteen 19 popped out at me a couple weeks ago when I was in my Bible, just reading through the Bible. And it, it's this, it says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. So John's in heaven. He's getting a glimpse of something in the throne room, and he says, Then the temple was open, and the, he saw the ark of the covenant in heaven. Do you know, how many of you have seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? Any, anyone, Indiana Jones? Yeah, the older people. Excellent. Okay, all you guys who have not seen Indiana Jones, well, never mind. All right, you should see it. I think it's amazing. So a lot of people, you know, when they're searching for the Ark, so Raiders of the Lost Ark is they're searching for the Ark of the Covenant. Well, there's a lot of, like, mystique around that whole search, but a lot of people have thought because of this passage in Revelation 11, it's like, oh, somehow it got caught up into heaven. And so it's no longer on the earth. Friends, I don't believe that for a moment. 
There was an Ark of the Covenant in heaven before there was an Ark of the Covenant on earth. Before God gave instructions of how to build the Ark of the Covenant, he showed them the pattern of what already existed in heaven because it's always been his ache that it would be on the earth as it is in heaven. And so we wrote, go, go, oh, this on the earth as it is in heaven thing, it's a bigger deal. It's not just no more poverty and it's not just no more sickness and it's not just no more human trafficking. It's like there's actually a, a pattern. There's actually a real temple and God wants it to be established on the earth. And so now I'm looking at the tabernacle of David even more closely going, wow, if that's Jesus, if that's what you were thinking and that was the answer to what you saw in the groan of your people was, you said, here's the groan, we're in need of a change of government. And he says, this is what you need to pray. Let it be on the earth as it is in heaven. Ask for the government of God. Ask for the government of God. So... I want to show four simple points from David's tabernacle and align them with heaven for a moment and then look at how that actually impacts my life. Meaning, it, I think it actually has impact because that's the kingdom that we're now a part of and it plays into what God's doing even on the earth right now. So, four elements, four elements that align with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom or the tabernacle of David or the tabernacle in heaven and the tabernacle on earth. First one, you've heard the passage, Revelation 4, 8 through 11. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you'll see in this passage the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, full of eyes around and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When John sees the throne room scene, there's living creatures and there's 24 elders and there's lightnings and there's thunderings and there's shakings. And in all of the center of that worship and heavenly atmosphere, God is at the center. In the tabernacle, in heaven, God is at the center. In the government, in heaven, God is at the center. It's the primary revelation of the kingdom of God is that God must be at the center. Okay, so we've seen heaven. This is going to be heaven. This is going to be earth. All right, so David's, the, uh, heaven's tabernacle, God is at the center. David's tabernacle, what does David do when he becomes king? Jot down Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10. I love this passage, and I love it in this context. Psalm 24 is, is, a, is a, it's a psalm of ascent. It's a, it's a psalm of, of, this, uh, of this march of the people of Israel bringing the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem. It's David's like, I'm going to bring the government of God back to the center. It says this, he says, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. So there's David. He's just become king over all Jerusalem, over all Israel. And the question he's asking, who is this king of glory? And he's making the point, it's not me. He makes the point in front of all of the people. It's not me. It's him. It's the Lord, strong and mighty, is the king, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Friends, David had lived for 20 years under the secular, humanistic rule of Saul. And he'd seen firsthand what government looks like when God is not at the center and he makes it his aim. He makes it his aim to put God at the center. So, heaven's tabernacle, God at the center. David's tabernacle, or earth's tabernacle, God at the center. Number two. Look at Revelation 4, verse 8. In heaven's tabernacle, there are four living creatures. Each of them with wings are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So in heaven, in heaven's tabernacle, in heaven's throne room, there are four living creatures. And the Bible says they've got eyes all around them. That's an odd picture in our minds. I think, I, I think artist depiction of... Artist depiction of the four living creatures can feel awkward. Next time. Excellent. Artists 
Artist's depiction of four living creatures can feel awkward because what does a creature look like with eyes all around it? I, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad I don't have eyes all around my body. It'd be so awkward. All right, I'm happy for the two I've got. I like them where they are. I like them that way, all right? But the, the four living creatures around the throne have eyes all around them, and it's the picture of these, these burning ones. Isaiah 6 calls them seraphim, and that means burning ones. And it's the eyes that are constantly beholding the beauty of Jesus. They fall in the place of worship. They never stop. And they're always gazing, always looking. Their whole being is about seeing him. That's what the eyes are about. It's, they're all about looking at Jesus. And they're the four primary worship leaders, I would call it, as they keep crying out, holy, holy, holy. They're calling heaven to worship. The four primary worship leaders of heaven. Well, look at David's, look at David's tabernacle in 1 Chronicles 25. 1 Chronicles 25, verse 1 specifically, you can look at it, but there you see that there are four primary worship leaders in David's tabernacle. First of all, David, of course, is the primary worship leader. He, he wrote most of the Psalms. He wrote the songs. He was the, the, the musician. He was the prophetic psalmist, priest, king. So David, you see in 1 Chronicles 25, and then they also assigned three others, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. And there you have four primary worship leaders for David's tabernacle who were to give primary leadership to worship. Now, I don't know about you, but I think in the pattern, one of the things that I've seen in that pattern of on earth as it is in heaven, the gift of a room like this, let's just say there's about 100 people in this room, is I only have two eyes. I might have mentioned this. I feel like I mentioned this on a Monday morning, but I only have two eyes, but you have two eyes, you have two eyes, you have two eyes, you have two eyes. And the gift of corporate worship and intercession is now it's not just my two eyes, but when you pray and when you worship and when you sing, we see what you see. And now it's not just my eyes, now it's not just two eyes looking at God at the center, but it's 200 eyes looking at God at the center. And I grow in my knowledge of God when you pray and when you sing and you open up your mouth because you see more of God. So in heaven's, taber in, in, in heaven's tabernacle, you see God at the center. You see four primary worship leaders. In David's tabernacle on the earth, you see God at the center and you see four primary worship leaders. It's a pattern developing. Let's keep going. Revelation 4 verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the throne. Now remember, this is what John's seeing. This isn't just a symbolism. John's seeing a real place. He's caught up into a real place. So Revelation 4, verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So next to the living creatures in the kingdom of heaven, there are 24 elders. It's like a circle of 24 elders. And commonly understood, those 24 elders clothed in white are human elders. They're not angelic beings. They're not, they're not living creatures. They're not something other than we are. They're human beings. And the picture there is that God brings human beings to the very center of his government. If you read on in Revelation 4, you'll see that what those 24 elders are doing is that they all have got a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which it says are the prayers of the saints. And so the picture is there is that human beings at the center of God's government function with him in leading the universe from the place of worship and prayer. That's it. They enter into the worship of heaven. They enter into the intercession of Jesus, Hebrews 7. And they enter in, and it's not just angels. It's not just crazy-looking living creatures. It's human beings in the very center of God's government. So what about David's tabernacle? Look for just a quick second at 1 Chronicles 25, verse 7 through 11 and 31. 7 through 11 and 31. I just want you to see this, and you can look at it later, but in 1 Chronicles 25, of course, we already saw at the beginning of this chapter, there's the four primary worship leaders, and then what they do is they begin to make up worship teams, is, is what it seems they're doing. 
So the number of them, along with their brothers, starting in verse 7, who were trained in singing to the Lord, all who were skilled was 288, and they cast lots for their duties, small and great, teacher and pupil. And the first lot fell for Asaph to Joseph, the second to Gedalia, to him and his brothers and his sons, 12, and the third to Zachar and his sons and his brothers, 12, and the fourth to Israel, his sons and his brothers, 12. And that goes on all the way to his brother and their sons, 12, all the way till verse 31. And to the 24th, to Romumpty, his sons and his brothers, 12. So First Chronicles 25 not only shows it that there's four primary worship leaders, but now they've made up 24 worship teams or 24 elders in David's kingdom. Friends, it's not an accident. I know you can look at that and kind of go like, well, uh, no. No, you just can't do that. I mean, what does that mean? 24 worship teams. That's what he's saying. It's like 24, and they were skilled singers and musicians. That's what they're saying. David set up 24 worship teams, 24 elders who sing day and night. So now you've got, in the tabernacle in heaven, you've got God at the center. You've got four primary worship leaders, and you've got 24 elders. And then, over here in David's tabernacle on the earth, you've got God at the center, who is this king of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty. You've got four primary worship leaders, and you've got 24 elders who lead worship teams. By chance? Let's keep going. One more. Revelation 4, verse 8, we know this one. And the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So now we're in the tabernacle in heaven, and we see that worship never stops. Those living creatures and 24 elders, there's a song that's being sung, and that holy, holy, holy never stops in heaven. We go, whoa, there's 24-7 worship and prayer in heaven. I think for many believers, we kind of like the idea of heaven and the thought of worship that never stops. I mean, of course, we'd all love to go, oh, my gosh, that would be amazing. But you know, as well as I do, if you're honest, that there are those times in worship where you're like, oh, my gosh, can we move on? Like, Does that ever happen to you? No. You're better than I. There's just are. Like, it's like, okay, can we move on? But friends, we've underestimated the glory of God if we think that we could possibly be bored of worship in heaven. If a creature with eyes all around can never stop falling in the place of worship, how much more me with my two eyes? Just as creatures in heaven were created for worship, so we will never be fully satisfied until we're living in that place ourselves. So in heaven... Worship never ends because his worth is endless. So, heaven, worship never stops. And this one's a little bit controversial, actually, but I feel like in my mind I've landed it, and I think we can all kind of land it. You, you look at David's tabernacle, and you look at passages like First Chronicles 16, verse 37, and you go, oh, so David left Asaph. So he left the four primary worship leaders before the Ark of the Covenant to minister regularly before the Ark as each day required. So if each of them minister regularly as each day required and there's 24 worship teams, you do the math. How long did they go? I think it was 24-7. I just landed it. It's just like it's too similar. Like, why would you have 24 worship teams who are assigned to duties daily if they're not going 24 hours a day? And then you have to kind of ask yourself the question, what came first, 24 elders in heaven or 24 hours a day on the earth? Was the day designed around the worship of heaven? Is it more strategic than we think it is? Is it more aligned to heaven than we think it is? Friends, there were well over 4,000 musicians that were assigned to the place of ministering to God day and night. What do you do? IHOP does it with less than 250 day and night. 
David's got 4,288. What do you do with them all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? I really think you can safely say David's kingdom, the worship never stopped. And so now you've got this striking similarity in the kingdom of heaven or the temple in heaven where God's at the center, where there are four primary worship leaders, where there's 24 elders ruling with God, human leaders ruling with God in the context of 24-7 worship. In David's tabernacle with God at the center, four primary worship leaders, 24 elders with worship teams, I believe, with worship that never stops. And that's the kingdom that Jesus said is going to last forever. That's the one that the Messiah is going to come through. Do you think that's an accident? That when Jesus taught us to pray, let it be on the earth as it is in heaven. And he came as a fulfillment of the promise that, that the Messiah would come through the line of David. Do you think he was not thinking about the worship of heaven on the earth as it is in heaven? You cannot tell me that. So what does that mean for us today? I think that's the big question. Right? Does that, does that mean we're going to like, oh, okay, where's our prim four primary worship leaders and where's our 24 worship teams? I, I, in some ways, I'm like, yes, let's do that. But it's bigger than that because the truth is the promise that came through Jesus is that, you know, the, the, he made the statement. He's like, I'm going to tear down the temple and I'm going to build it again in three days. Why? Because we're going to be those living stones, the very dwelling place of God, a kingdom of priests before God scattered across the earth who will pray without ceasing like Paul admonished us to. Look at the promise in Acts 15. There, there's a con Contentious conversation about, whoa, there's Gentile people getting saved, and, and whoa, there's, there's Gentile people getting the Holy Spirit. What does that mean after 4,000 years of human history basically saying the opposite? What does that mean? And in that context, this promise is, they're reminded of this promise is in Amos 9.11, and this is Acts 15, where it's quoted, verse 16 and 17. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So there you see in Acts 15, in the promise in Amos 9:11 that the coming Messiah from the line of David, that the restoring of David's tabernacle would actually equal the coming in of the Gentiles. That it was all about the salvation of the nations. So there's this tie to the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, and the direct movement of the Great Commission to all nations. That's what Acts 15 is. So we find that, that the kingdom of David was a picture of a coming Messiah, that Jesus was the prophetic fulfillment of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Yes, he was. He was. But he's bringing his kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven, and we live in a unique time where worship and prayer is being highlighted by God, the Holy Spirit, across the earth like never before. And it's not circumstantial. Because Jesus, just like David, ripped open the veil and brought back man into his presence. David took away the veil. Jesus took away the veil. David liberated his kingdom. Jesus liberated a kingdom of priests. David restored his people to the place of dominion over the nations. Jesus restored his people to a place of dominion over nations. That's the place we live from right now. Jesus was the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David. And of course, as the promise says, it means the gospel, the Great Commission is going to all people. It's the incoming of the Gentiles tied to the on earth as it is in heaven reality. I was asking myself, even, even as I was just meditating on this, and just going, is it any wonder that the major growth in the prayer movement happened at the same time as Table 71? 1999, 2000, was this lightning rod movement of God to establish this movement of night and day prayer on the earth. 
at the same point in time, there's a gathering in the Netherlands to bring together missions organizations to go after the Great Commission. Do you think that's an accident? I don't think so. It's very intentional by God. And since that time, we've seen exponential movement forward in the on the earth as it is in heaven reality. The government of God, the church moving into the place of worship and prayer in the advance of the kingdom. So let me make this real practical for us right now. So what does that mean for us? <laughs> Number one, I mean, that, that, is, that, that right there is a picture of why we have a prayer room on the YWAM base. We believe in the power that God's government is primarily in that place of worship and intercession. Now, does that mean that we all just have to live in a prayer room every day? No, it doesn't. Does it mean it's important? Yes, it does. It's his government. It shifts things. When we sing and when we pray, we execute vengeance on nations. We have more power in that place of worship and intercession than any other place. But for all of us, practically, in the body of Christ, when I look at those four realities and I look at the fact that I am the dwelling place of God, that I, that I, that I am a, a king and a priest before God, then I am a living stone, a stone that's part of the dwelling place of God. It means I can live that reality right now wherever I am. It means that in my life, I can put God at the center of my finances, my schedule, my entertainment, my recreation, everything in my life. I can put God at the center. I can go to all the other idols that are so quickly creeping in and go, who is this king of glory? It's not me. It's the Lord, strong and mighty in my life. I've got to put, I, we've got to have him at the center, friends. In this hour, we've got to be living stones, kings and priests, the dwelling place of God, the, the place where his glory dwells means we've got to put them at the center. We've got to aim to be burning ones. I'm, not, I'm never going to have eyes all around my body, I hope. But I really want to live in the place of gazing on the beauty of Jesus daily, always. I want that seraphim reality. I want to be known as a burning one. I want to gaze on the beauty of Jesus. I want to open up his word. I want to sing it, pray it all day long. I want to meditate it. And I want to, like the prophet said, I, I want it to be like a fire that's shut up in my bones. And I want a little bit of the fire of heaven to touch me. I want God at the center. I want to be a burning one. I want to know my place of authority. If God, number three, if God has brought human beings to the very center of his government in heaven, that means I have authority here on the earth. And it's greater than I know. It's greater than I realize, and I need to go to the word to see it so that I can walk in it every day. I want to walk in it. I want to walk in the authority he's given me. I don't just want to kind of meander through life. I want to walk in the authority that was given me as a king and a priest, brought into the very center, clothed in white, in the very righteousness of God. I want to walk in the authority that he's given me right now. Not just waiting for another day far off. Going for it right now. I want to put God at the center. I want to be a burning one. I want to take my place of authority as an elder around the throne of God every day. And I want to do it 24-7. I, I want to give my life worship in spirit and in truth. I want to offer up my body as a living sacrifice of worship every day from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed at night. It makes more sense why Paul says, pray without ceasing. It's that on earth as it is in heaven reality. You go, well, that's impossible. I can't pray without ceasing. No, it's not impossible. You can dwell with God. You can have fellowship, conversation with God all day long. As you walk and talk around the base and as you're in meetings and as you're in worship and prayer and before you go to bed at night and God encounter me in, in the night, God. I want that 24-7 reality. I can be the very dwelling place of God today. That's what Jesus did on the cross. 
That's what we want to walk in, the on earth as it is in heaven reality. Yes, I believe he's bringing his government. Yes, I believe the church is going to move into a place of 24-7 worship and prayer all over the earth. I believe it. That's what I'm giving my life for. But I believe it's not just going to be in a room. It's going to be everywhere. And every believer is going to be living as a king and a priest before the throne of God every day. God at the center Eyes set on the beauty of Jesus, burning, taking our place of authority as kings and priests and living that sacrifice of worship all day long. It's where the power is, friends. It's where the power is. It's the on earth as it is in heaven reality. When we're talking about the on earth as it is in heaven reality, we're not primarily talking about the benefits we get like we have done with so many other things in the gospel, we've turned the attention to us. And the attention of the on earth as it is in heaven reality was always to be about him. That he would be at the center. That he would be given the worship that do, that's due his name. That he would have his place of authority. That he would have the labor of his soul. That he would have a people who love him from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. It was never just about us. But the good news is that when we agree with the government of heaven, everything shifts. And he does bring about blessing that is unfathomable. And it might not be as the world sees it. But as I've walked with him in ministry for 30 years... I've seen all kinds of pain and disappointment and disillusionment, and I don't have much. But I wouldn't have it any other way, and I've known greater joy and exhilaration than most people I know. Just because I, I get to live the on earth as it is in heaven reality. And I just want to invite us again, because this is who we are. Like, we signed up for this, right? We signed up. We're giving our life to shift the government on the earth. That's the role of the church. The role of the church at the end of the day, and I love the way Mark talks about, and it's not just in the religious sphere, it's in every sphere. The role of the church is to take over. And ultimately, it's not gonna be until Jesus comes, but we go and we serve and we love and we labor and we sow and we give sacrificially to labor for that kingdom like a mustard seed that seems so foolish today. But one day it's going to be the greatest of all the trees and will provide shade to all the nations. That's the one that you signed up for. And I just want to invite us, even as we close, to just respond again. Like, God, we sign up. Like, I want it to be on the earth as it is in heaven, and I want it to start with me. Not a program, not, not, not an initiative on our base, not a, isn't it cool that there's a prayer movement? No, I want it to start with me. I want to live this reality today. I want to do my ministry from this place. I want my meetings from this place, my, um, my evangelism from this place, my discipleship. That's, a, that's how we want to make disciples. How, I want to make disciples who have God at the center, who are gazing on the beauty of Jesus, who see their authority as kings and priests and are ministering to day and night with their whole lives. I want to make those kind of disciples of another kingdom. So let's just stand together and respond to God I think the invitation for the church in this hour, even as he reveals to us mysteries of the kingdom, that's what he's doing. He's revealing mysteries of the kingdom, is to just respond. We go, God, I want to give you, I want to give it all to you. I, I want the on earth as it is in heaven reality in my own life. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. I want God at the center. I want my eyes fixed on the beauty of Jesus. I want to be a burning one. I want a fire shut up in my bones. I want, I want to take my place as a king and a priest boldly before the throne of God. And I want to live that reality day after day, night after night, from the time the sun gets up in the morning to the time it goes down at night and through the night. I want to live that reality. That's, that's the kingdom that's coming. That's the kingdom that we want to live in right now. So I just want to invite you tonight to just 
say yes again to the on earth as it is in heaven reality. And I just want you to come and just respond. It's like all of us can just kind of go like, yes, Lord, I want to sign up for the on earth as it is in heaven. I want that. I want those four things. I want whatever the tabernacle in heaven looks like and whatever David's tabernacle looked like and that promise that you fulfilled on the cross. I want that in my life, God. I just want to invite you to come and we want to pray for you tonight that God would anoint us to be burning ones. That he would anoint us to walk before him day and night. So just as we sing, I invite you to come and just respond. Just go, God, I want, I want the on earth as it is in heaven reality. Start with me. It's really that simple.